Hey everybody, this is the 80 Slasher Librarian, and today I want to share with you something a longtime subscriber of mine and a good friend, Sean Campbell, wrote. He knew that I wasn't very pleased with how Halloween the Old Myers Place ended, because some of the characters that probably deserved to fall at Michael's Blade, their stories were just cut off halfway through the book with no resolution, especially Josh Pender. So, he wrote me a little alternate epilogue for the book. And I'm going to go ahead and record this today and include it with the playlist of the book, Halloween the Old Myers Place, for anybody that's interested in this fanfic alternate ending to Halloween the Old Myers Place. Here we go. The full moon shone dimly behind a blanket of dark gray clouds in the sky as Jackson DeWitt stumbled out of Josh's party in a daze. A combination of ingesting many beers, chasing that freak and his lover all over town, and drinking harder back at Josh's party had put him in a heavy stupor. He fumbled in his letterman jacket for his pack of Marlboro Lights. His vision was hazy, but he struggled to focus his concentration on carefully fishing one of the cigarettes from the pack. He was so focused that he didn't see the figure approaching from the woods. He sniffed the air in confusion. He smelt something burning, but he hadn't lit his cigarette yet. He smelled burnt plastic and rotting meat. The aroma was overpowering, but he shook his head, thinking that the alcohol had been harder on him than he thought. The crinkling of the plastic Marlboro pack helped to mask the gentle crackling of branches and dry leaves under the heavy boots of the shape in a black jumpsuit. As Jackson lit his cigarette and took a large inhale, Strong hands gripped around his throat and started to squeeze like vice grips. Jackson, in a moment of primal instinct, spasmed and kicked his attacker with both feet, delivering a sharp blow to his left knee. The shape relinquished his grip slightly, which Jackson took advantage of and yanked himself from the attacker's grip. He turned to face him, but the attacker regained control of the situation by pinning Jackson against a tree. He easily lifted the football player with one tightly gripped fist while the other hand brandished a large blood cake butcher's knife. With a hard piercing jab, Michael Myers drove the knife deep into the football player. The sharpened point of the knife cut through Jackson's ribcage through his spinal cord with a hard snap and exited out the flesh of his back, pinning him to the large oak tree outside Josh's house. Michael turned his head to the side slightly as he observed the flailing teenager starting to lose his movement as he succumbed to darkness. Michael could only see two more figures inside the house. His vision was blurred from the melted plastic of his white mask, seared into his corneas, but he could sense them, smell them. He growled, baring his rotting teeth. He surveyed his surroundings for a potential weapon. He walked over to the large black iron gate that was part of a larger salmon-colored wall that spanned the length of the pole area. He gripped one of the poles and started the pull with all of his might. There was a screech of bending metal under unimaginable pressure, and it snapped as easily as plastic. The shape gripped the iron bar tightly, seething with rage as he spotted a stumbling French maid in the kitchen. She was being followed by another football player, who was grabbing her arm and yelling incoherently at her. Tears ran through her mascara and her hair was disheveled. She was trying unsuccessfully to put her stiletto heels on, but the large male took her shoes and threw them out onto the patio. You're such a jerk, shouted the girl, ripping her arm out of the meaty paws of the jock. She bustled out onto the patio at a quickened pace. The motion sensor flooded the patio with light, illuminating the path and blinding the girl. She was unaware of the menacing figure that stood behind her until she took a step backwards. She turned on a dime and peered into the blank, pale, and motionless melted mask of Michael Myers. She saw the iron bar in his hand and opened her mouth to scream. Michael raised the bar high when he was tackled from behind. Hey, you freak! What are you doing? cried the jock as he tried to wrestle the bar from Michael's grip. The iron pole flew from Michael's hand, damaging the patio light and turning its steady stream of light into a strobe light. Brief flashes of light illuminated the fighting figures. Michael hissed and tried to push the beefy teenager off of him. Not a difficult task as the alcohol had slowed the teenager down, which would ultimately be his quick downfall. 
Michael quickly got to his feet and delivered a powerful kick down onto the teenager's chest, shattering most of his ribs. Crimson blood squirted from his mouth as he struggled to regulate his breathing. Each breath was sending razor blades into his lungs. The maid, clearly in a daze ever since she saw the football player attack the intruder, found herself awoken to consciousness as the arterial spray from the player hit her in the face. The warm blood shocked her back to the moment, and she turned to run. Michael took no chances and wasted no time as he drove the iron pole straight through her midsection. Her eyes grew wide in terror as the sudden realization of her predicament dawned on her. Before she could react, Michael lifted her off the ground, turned her upside down, and drove the point of the stake through the chest of the football player on the ground. The two faces of the dying teenagers met as the maid slid down the pole, finally resting on top of the boy's body. They held an unwanted and horrid embrace as they both died entangled in one another. Michael observed the two for a moment before looking up to the one moving shadow in the upper window. The last teenager was finishing off a can of Pap's Blue Ribbon and clutching his hair with a grimace. One more to go. The shape stopped by the pool before going upstairs. He found the dial that controlled the pool's temperature. With one grimy black hand that was stained with blood and scarred beyond belief, he turned the control to its highest temperature and then snapped off the control with a hard yank. The pool started to bubble and boil under a temperature of 130 degrees. The steam illuminating under the strobe light of the patio light that was damaged by the iron pole. Josh paced in his bedroom, sipping beer and cursing Mary for refusing him, cursing Jeff for spreading lies and mistrust, cursing the football players for not catching the two freaks. He'd get them back, that much he was sure of. Both of them had a hard school year coming up, starting Monday. He was unaware of the large shape walking up the stairs and walking into his room. The shadow of the figure caught the attention of the inebriated teenager. And before he could react, Michael grabbed the teenager and lifted him off the ground as easy as he would a rag doll. Michael tossed the screaming teenager through the window pane of his balcony, and he plummeted to the ground. Josh cracked his skull against the concrete surrounding his pool and lie beside it, blood gushing from the open wound. The blood started to leak into the pool, turning the foaming, steaming water bright red. As he started to gain consciousness, the figure appeared beside him, no mercy in his cold, black, dead eyes. Please, please stop, begged the crying teenager, losing all composure and starting to sober up. Michael grabbed Josh Pender by the neck with extreme prejudice and dragged his head towards the raging waters and held his head under the water. Josh flailed and waved his hands, desperately trying to wrench himself free from the monstrous grip. He couldn't move an inch as water pervaded his mouth, spilling into his throat and down into his lungs. It was only when he was within an inch of consciousness that the hands yanked him from the water. The skin of Josh's face was bright red and blistering. He sputtered and coughed as he started to choke on blood and chlorine water. The shape stood over the teenager as he convulsed. He brought up his mud cake torn leather boot and brought it down with full force onto Josh's face, crushing his skull in. Michael looked from the teenager's mangled face up to the full moon, which was now shining bright in the sky above them. His house was gone, and the kids were all dead. He was going to go home now, back to the only other home he'd ever known. So yeah, thank you, Sean Campbell, for writing this little alternative ending to the book. Um, yeah, I mean, I really enjoyed the book, The Old Myers Place. But it really left me at the end of it upset that they didn't finish up any type of story for Josh Pender. You know, after he uh, showed his true colors and was chasing them away from the party, you just really got the feeling that Michael Myers was going to cross their path as well. But it never happened. The book just ended abruptly after the explosion and everything. So uh, Sean Campbell heard my commentary on that and heard what it was I didn't like about the book. 
and wrote this alternative ending. And I got to say, it was very well written, Sean. And I think it ties in to the story perfectly. And it it feels like it's part of the writing. You wrote just like Kelly O'Rourke. It really seemed like Michael left the explosion and on his way to the uh, asylum that he's going to be in in the next book, The Madhouse, he came across Josh's party. It just flowed perfectly. So thank you for that. And I hope anyone that listened to this entire book enjoyed this alternate ending as well. And I'll see you very soon. Until then, this has been your friendly neighborhood 80 slasher librarian saying, thanks for listening, and thank you, Sean, for this awesome alternate epilogue. See you later.